Welcome, everybody. I'm John McAuliffe. I coordinate the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, we are, are very happy, proud, in fact, that two people who work with us in VPCC are in, deeply involved in having produced this film. Um, and there are several other VPCC folks who are, are on this call. Um, what we will be doing is hearing from the director, the two, one of the producers, uh, one of the stars of the show, Rusty Eisenberg, and uh, Michael Doyle, who is a local historian, um, to give you some ideas about the way that, that the film can be used. Um, and then we'll open it up for your questions uh, because of some time constraints on um, Steve Talbot. We'll have the, him first presenting about collaboration with PBS stations and take direct questions on that topic with him. And then he'll have to go off. Uh, and then we will uh, uh, come back to the other three speakers. So uh, if you want more of people's bios, if you didn't read it when you went to the sign up page, they are, are there and uh, that page will remain forever or at least as much as anything is forever on this world. Um, and uh, as will this, this video. So uh, you are, what you say now will be looked at by graduate students in 20 years who are trying to figure out what was going on <laughs> about Vietnam 50 years after the war, almost 50 years after the war ended. So Stephen, if you want to say a little bit about yourself and then about the film and then the how to work with PBS stations. Uh, sure. Thanks a lot, John. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And I'm especially happy to see three people who are in the film, Mary Posner and Rusty Eisenberg, Carolyn Eisenberg, and David Hawk. And I want to thank you three again for being in the film because you all gave us terrific interviews uh, that are prominent in this film. Um, that we've been working on for three years. So it's now about to happen, as you all know. Um, and we're very fortunate to be now part of a series on PBS, American Experience, which um, brands itself as the most watched uh, history program on television. It's been around for a long time and they're really showcasing the film, which is wonderful. I mean, Robert and I had been thinking about this as a one-shot special for a long time on PBS, but American Experience uh, liked it when they saw it and they grabbed it and they're promoting it now. And interestingly enough, on their own, uh, they are describing this, they're marketing the film as a film about the power of protest. That's the phrase that they came up with once they'd seen the film. So Robert and I were very pleased by that and they have a publicity machine, which is great to be part of. So they've created a poster for the film already. Uh, they created a 30 second teaser, which they do for all their shows. And they've already uh, put out a long detailed press release, which was an excellent press release. And they've distributed this short description and teaser to all PBS stations in the country from New York to Guam. And most, if not all of them, have already posted that on their websites. So the PBS stations, the PBS world, has been alerted about the show. Um, it's, being, it's already been featured in a lot of the program guides, especially the one in Boston, uh, but here in San Francisco, KQED as well. So <clears throat> this is getting as much promotion as you can get on public TV, which, uh, which we're thrilled with. Um, and again, it's March 28th, uh, nine o'clock at night. It's a 90 minute show. It's eight central time. And our lead in is uh, one of the most popular shows these days on PBS, Henry Louis Gates' Finding Your Roots show. So that's what comes on first and leads in, hopefully delivers us a nice audience. So 
the big picture about this is that we really have a chance to reach, we are going to reach a very large audience with this film. Um, and that's what we're very excited about. And any additional promotion that we can bring to this um, is enormously appreciated. And uh, we'll, we'll expand that, uh, that audience even further. But we're off to a really good start. We have a really good platform. And I think it's an opportunity to reach uh, a, a really large number of Americans with, um, with a different view about the anti-war movement and with this very important story that happened in 69. Steve, how would a local person who wanted to connect to a PBS station, what could they do with them and who would they reach out to to do it? Well, that's really sort of up to individuals. I mean, I'll, I'll give you some examples of what can be done. Um, I don't want to steal her thunder, but I heard right before we started this seminar that uh, Mary Posner, on her own initiative, um, reached out to a public TV station in Indiana in her neighborhood, and they're going to interview her now. She can tell you about that later, uh, but that's wonderful. Um, and... American Experience has already contacted a number of people who've been interviewed for the program um, to find out if they'd be willing to be interviewed by the media who are interested, either in their local neighborhood or nationally, and that's underway. That's starting to happen. So um, that's all terrific. Now, in terms of someone in VPCC, an individual, an activist who wants to uh, connect with their local PBS station, I mean, I'll tell you, at the simplest, most basic level, it's thanking the station for running a program like this. Um, and that can happen after it's broadcast. But even beforehand, to just say, I see this program is coming, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, and by email, by phone call, or shockingly, I know from having been inside PBS for years, that a letter knocks them off their feet when they see a letter actually in the mail about a show. So they like to hear from their audience about programs. So that's, that's just a very simple, positive thing that people could do. Now, if they're more ambitious, there are some stations who still have the staff and the interest to be able to do public events, you know, screenings of a film and discussions at the station that the station would sponsor. Um, and to find out about that, someone would just contact the station, ask someone for the events or promotion person or the publicity person for the station and see if they're open to that kind of thing. Some stations will be and some won't. Um, but that's always, that's always worth the effort if someone wants to do that. Would they be interested in somebody who 50 years ago in that city or in another city was active in the kinds of events that the film describes or shows? They might, John, they might. And that's why it's worth trying. I mean, again, you know, of the 330 plus PBS stations, some are very big, some are medium sized and some are very small and they all have different staffs and capabilities. But, you know, here in San Francisco, they have a morning radio talk show forum that has two hours in the morning. And that's probably the most widely listened radio show um, in, in the Bay Area. And, you know, a show like that is always open to hearing from people who have ideas for programs. And so if someone has a particularly interesting story, uh, it's possible they could be interviewed for a show like that. So you just have to it all depends on what the capabilities of are of an individual PBS station. But a lot of the smaller ones and local ones do want to hear from their audience and, and like putting local people on. That's great to know. Um, and I'm sure that if somebody has got a mailing list, a community organization or a peace network in that community, um, or just a neighborhood organization of some kind, that the station would be overjoyed if they put a promo about it, put the link to the 
trailer and a link to the uh, publicity information. Absolutely. And, and, that, and that link, okay. as I'm saying, already exists on the American Experience website. And all the stations that I've seen have now begun posting it on their sites too, locally. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a very simple link to pass around. And PBS stations, go ahead. I, I wanted to know, uh, what about streaming services? Are, you know, for people who've cut the cord, the cable cord, um, uh, is it possible, is, is it gonna be streamed at the, on the same day, March 28th? Absolutely, that's a really good question. Yes, yeah, streaming of course is central these days. And yes, it starts streaming at the exact time it's broadcast. Right. So right. that night at nine o'clock, March 28th, 8 p.m. Central, it'll start streaming. And it'll be streaming for free on pbs.org for at least a month. And then it may switch over to a system, PBS Passport, that has, you know, a, a, a paywall to get into. You have to be a PBS contributor, I think, to watch it after that. But it will have a long life on PBS um, streaming and especially important for that first month after the broadcast. So anyone and, should be able to see this anywhere in America. And they, they opportunity to get a record of, sorry, go ahead, Rusty. Yeah, I just, I just to clarify, so um, for the following month afterwards, at any point that people could, could watch it for a month, it'll be available to them, is that right? For free, yes, on pbs.org. So if you go to pbs.org or pbs.org slash video, you come up for all these programs that are available. And this will be there and it'll be featured because it's part of the series, American Experience. And um, they will push that because they're all interested in getting as many streaming views as possible. And John, I think your question was, can we track this? I mean, yes, we get full reports about how many people watched on streaming. Uh, so that might encourage them to re-show it later on as a fundraiser or some summer programming of some kind. This will have many reruns because mm -hmm. if you look at any show on American Experience, um, you know, they used to do many more shows in a year. They do fewer episodes now, but uh, they're frequently repeated. So you can rest assured that this show will be, have many broadcasts. Yeah, Mary. I'm um, when, when it's available for streaming, could we do something like, um, I was thinking it would be cool to go to the local high school and stream it during their history class. Is that possible? Once it's, once it's streaming, you know, I mean, there may be rules in a particular school, high school or something, but you know, it's, it's streaming for anybody to see any time. So okay. as far as I know, it's just a question of, you know, when you would set that up for a, a watch party or, or something in a school or a community center. Right, because I'm thinking the time that it's actually showing the first time is late for a lot of people. And of course, you can't show it at a school at nine o'clock at night, but right. later on when it's streaming, right. we have all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. Yes, so again, it'll be streaming starting that same time as it's broadcast and it'll be at, it's absolutely free and available to everyone, at least for a month. And after that, it may switch over to this PBS Passport system, but it will still be available for streaming. Mary, why don't you go ahead and talk about your own experience with the local station? Okay, we, well, we um, let, I've been kind of excited me. about this for a while, so. Should we, should we let Steve go? Because he has well, to. Well, let's finish up. I don't think we're quite finished with the PBS piece. So, so go, ahead. go ahead, Mary. Okay, well, I, I just sent an email to the local PBS station in Evansville, and I included the um, press release uh, from the American Experience and just let them know that they were going to be showing this soon and that I happened to be in it and that I would be available if they'd like to talk to me before it, it aired. And um, I, I knew the name, I think this helped. I knew the name of somebody who did a program featuring local people. So I said, could you pass this email along to him? 
So the next day I got a phone call from him. <laughs> it just tickled me because I've heard his voice for years and there he was on my phone. Anyway, he was very excited and um, immediately said he wanted to interview me. So I don't actually have a television, so I didn't even know he did things on TV, but um, actually he's just gonna do a radio interview of me, but it's a very popular show. Um, I emailed him today and just said, I have a lot of memorabilia. It'd be nice to be able to show it if you could do a video, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So, so that I think it helped that I had a name and I thought this would really fit in with what he did. Um, I also sent an email to the PBS station in Indianapolis and told them I was born and raised in Indianapolis and that some of the footage might actually take place in Indianapolis. I don't know because I haven't seen it, but we did protest Nixon right in Indianapolis. So um, I haven't heard from them, but I will try again. And I think I will also, any place I've lived, I mean, what the heck, um, Muncie, Bloomington, and then I spent 10 years in Connecticut. So uh, I just say, what the heck? And it, it's no big deal to send these emails and um, we'll see what happens. Good. Um, any other specific question about PBS for Steve? So we can- Well, well I was wondering if, um, if, if American Experience would like to know from people like us that we are available, would somebody up at the high, the top there, want to know? They already know, Mary. They okay. know. Okay. Yes. And okay. uh, as I say, they're out, you know, making that known to media people to see if they want to do any interviews. So, yes, okay. that's really important. That's great. Good question. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll say one thing uh, uh, that all of you could help on. Um, they've asked us to send them any names of people we know in the media have a personal connection to who might be interested in reviewing the show or in promoting it in any way. So if there is anybody anywhere from the New York Times to NPR to your local newspaper or radio station, who, uh, where you know someone uh, who might be interested, please send us those Who's emails, those? you know, name and email. Yeah, I, I'll put my email in the chat and people can just email me with that information. That's great, Robert. So that, that would be a very useful thing. We'd appreciate that. Um, just else? one more thing. I, I um, I, I got in touch with people. I got in touch with people. Am I muted? No, oh. you're fine. Um, I, got, I got in touch with people in Muncie. You think that they might be interested in this since it, the little segment with me is in Muncie. I haven't heard a word from them. Not Ball State itself, which you think they could might care, and not the students newspaper. Nothing back from them. So that's kind of disappointing that they don't even want to do something okay. about their own place. But I, I will try again. All right. Any well, I, appreciate, I appreciate your efforts, Mary. As, as my old high school football coach would say, that's great hustle. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> let me, Stephen, let me ask you a broader political question, which is whether as this, as the publicity gets out, do you expect any blowback? And uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Rusty got some sense from Texas Tech whether there's any blowback likely to come from people who aren't happy about this rediscovery of this period of time and this history. Well, uh, nothing, nothing yet at all on that on that score. Um, I mean, I expect that there are some people who are going to watch this who won't like the politics of it or the point of view of what we have reported. Um, but that's par for the course. I mean, I think Robert and I have always hoped that this would reach people beyond the converted and that it would be informative and provocative and it would cause people to think and debate. So uh, I'm, I'm fully expecting as with almost every show I've ever done for PBS, that there will be uh, debate and discussion. Um, but in terms of any, you know, organized opposition or anything like that, uh, nothing as of yet. 
Okay, great. All right, Robert. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you Go. all very much. Really wait, 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 wait. Vivian had a. Uh, or Vivian, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Quick. Yeah, if a group wanted to show this as part of a fundraiser and charge people to see it, is that against uh, the arrangement you have with PBS? Uh, that's beyond my scope. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> once something exists to stream or once, you know, it's going to be available, a DVD version will be available, something uh -huh. we have to create. Um, you know, people are free to do things with it in any way. Um, there are, you know, restrictions on rights we have for, um, you know, when it gets beyond TV and festival use. But I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I would say if, you know, mm -hmm. you, a group wanted to take it on and do something with it, I don't think anyone's going to be upset about that. Okay. I think as long as you distinguish, this is the PBS show and you can watch it free in the comfort of your home, or if you want to come and talk about it and hear so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so who was active in the anti-war movement in our town and that's what you're asking a donation for that associated event i think there could be absolutely no complaint about that so yes sure. i just wanted to say hello paul is that paul yes yeah. oh my god hi paul how are you we haven't seen each other in uh, more yes. years than i want to count you... <laughs> all right but yes, you're but uh, is it... thanks this for your is... book paul Thank you. This is going to be a permanent record. So, okay. Afterwards. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Robert. Okay. okay. Um, I, I uh, had a couple of uh, just ads to. I'm the executive producer of the film. And uh, anyway, I have a couple of things to add. They, uh, one of the specific things, will, I mean, we might deal with this later, but that we do have, we actually, part of our contract is that they do plan to do, you know, how PBS has those member nights where they ask for donations and so on. That is part of our contract. So they are from the outset planning to do that. And that usually happens several months after the initial uh, broadcast. So, you know, anyway, that's one point. Um, and also, in addition to, at least after you know after the month or so for sure on pbs.org uh our understanding it's in our contract that it's going to be on uh prime video uh apple tv and you know other other places that it might be uh available but usually you know it's 395 or something like that to rent the film uh for streaming you know that okay and then the third thing that just to add what steve said is that in the audience report that we got initially before it was American Experience, uh, they anticipated uh, almost a million people for the premiere, uh, you know, on PBS. And then in the first two weeks after the uh, premiere that they anticipated something like 150,000 to be streaming. So we are really... I mean, that's what that's what we're talking about in terms of numbers. OK, um, now Steve Ladd is also on uh, and and Steve knows a lot more about uh, the boys who said no than I do. But let me just give some uh, background, a little bit of background about the film. Uh, Steve and I uh, worked on the boys who said no film, which is a film about the draft resistance movement. And one of the things that I was felt somewhat frustrated in that uh, doing that film was that there hadn't been any films on the overall peace movement, you know, the the peace movement that millions of people were involved in. I mean, there were there were you know lots of us that were draft resistors and you know part of that, and there've been films about the uh, you know like Sir No Sir about the. Um, you know, the, the vet resistors. And uh, and then God knows how many films have been about the Chicago uh, events, you know, the 
convention events and then, uh, you know, the Weather Underground, good Lord, how many have there been? But, you know, the mainstream anti-war movement, there hadn't been. So the idea was, you know, uh, you know, from the beginning of this was to try to do something about that. And then I don't have to go into the details unless somebody's interested about why we picked the 1969 story, uh, you know, to tell that story of what happened with the moratorium and the mobilization, and then the behind the scenes of how that actually had such a huge impact on the people in the White House. So anyway, that's why, you know, so, and that's what our focus is, and that's what, what we're telling, but we feel like we're telling that whole story. And then I, I just say one other thing, that the, the uh, you know, the, there's a uh, Viet Nguyen uh, did a, you know, in, his, in one of his books, he has a, uh, you know, the novelist, uh, he has a quote that he, he says that wars are fought twice, first on the battlefield and then later in memory. And I think in many ways, we won, you know, the battle in a sense of helping to stop the war. But we have lost, basically without a fight, <laughs> the battle for memory. And this this film really is a unique opportunity to tell our story to a broad mass audience. And it's very much in line with what VPCC, you know, the, its whole raison d'etre is to, you know, resurrect the, the story that's really been ignored, caricatured, distorted, uh, you know, up, up to now. So anyway, I, I think that trying to do the most we can to, uh, you know, use this vehicle of this film to start to change the narrative so that it's going to be remembered in a different way. And we don't really know what other kinds of things might happen as a result of what we're going to do, but I think that we're going to get something in motion that might have uh, a much bigger impact than we can think of at this time. Uh, because let's face it, there were millions of people who were involved in, in our movement and it, it's basically going to die with us unless we do something right now. So anyway, so that's the kind of, you know, that's my, <laughs> you that's know, really why, why we're doing it. That's eloquent, all. eloquent. Okay. Could, could well, you now, say, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, what I, uh, okay. I think that, you know, the specific question that, you know, about the boys film, I'd like to, to ask Steve Ladd, who was also one of the producers of the boys film and produce, you know, co-producer of this film, you know, to say what has been done to, you know, okay, if that's all right. Just yeah, go sure, ahead, Steve. Steve, go ahead. Sure, well, um, let me just sort of come off of what Robert was saying too, that, you know, what Steve Talbot said, ultimately this film is about the power of protest. And I think that's what's gonna make it of interest um, to people who may not care that much about what happened during the Vietnam War, but see how these protests were organized and the impact that they had, which was not known at the time, but it was a very significant impact. And the way the demonstrations were organized and David Hawk and others talk well about this in the film, you know, broad-based, Cora Weiss talks a lot about she wanted to make sure families felt comfortable coming, you know, to build that kind of broad-based um, protest and, uh, and so forth. And, you'll, you know, you'll see more in the film. But there's something about it that's a very general message about the power of protest. So part of what we want to do is reach broadly for this film. To reach, we're working on reaching all the sort of usual organizations and working through VPCC and the boys said no list and uh, actually a list that Terry compiled earlier of organizations all over the country. So first step with this film, and then I'll talk a little about the boys film, is we want to reach as wide as possible. So any help people have with connections to other organizations, other constituencies, you know, that's really important to spread the word as widely as possible. Not just peace organizations, but organizations that want to see the 
the inspiration from this film about you know what it takes to actually have an impact and that you don't always know what kind of impact you have so it's important that you keep doing what you're doing um anyway so um so any help you can give sort of along those lines people here would be great um in terms of the boys who said no film it honestly has not reached the audience that we hope yet uh, it's in educational distribution through bullfrog films there have been uh quite a number of community screenings where people have used it uh, for a variety of purposes with different audiences, some free screening, some charging and so forth. And this film will also be available, the Movement of the Bad Band will be available through PBS distribution uh, after the screenings, after the broadcast, excuse me, for educational purposes. So PBS distribution is another part of this process. So it will be available for classrooms and other institutions through PBS distribution. Um, and for, um, uh, you know, um, consumer sales too, with DVD or whatever. Um, and then PBS is also, PBS International is going to be distributing this internationally. And Steve Talbot is working on a 52 minute cut, which is what most international broadcasters require. Um, so it will be available internationally. So at some point, We'll want to make other international uh, connections too. But um, the boys who said no film, we're still seeking broadcast and streaming options. And we do have a PBS connection that we're pursuing at this point with the um, you know, 50th anniversary with the movie into Mad, Gen Mad Men getting PBS broadcast and a variety of other things like the unfortunate passing of David Harris and Dan Ellsberg, of course, with his three to six months to live. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other reasons that we're hoping PBS will eventually broadcast the film. But in terms of, um, you know, lessons from the boys' film, what we can learn here is, you know, that community screenings are important. And it's helpful to have um, a guide for people, perhaps, you know, saying with, with sort of outlining what some key questions might be for people to discuss about this film, both in terms of the history and in terms of what's relevant for today. Um, so, you know, something simple like that is something we might want to work on uh, to encourage people to use it um, either during the broadcast, after the broadcast, and later, of course, in community screenings and even classrooms. So, um, that's what I have to add for the moment. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we will now uh, ask Rusty Carolyn Eisenberg, who is uh, featured in the film, but is also the wonderful additional resource to go with the film because she has just published a book that fits like a glove with the message of the film. And she's uh, see, been seen on many, many programs. Um, this is probably, she said, the fourth in the last two weeks. So Rusty, putting on your hat as a teacher, could you give a sense of how this film might be used? Well, um, I'm still thinking about it to be truthful. Uh, can people hear me? I can't tell if I'm unmuted. Yes, you're fine. Okay. Um, so I think just lean gonna be back a, bit, a little bit, lean okay. back a little. Okay, there you go. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a process, I think, for all of us. Um, and my guess in terms of how this film is, can be used educationally will be the fact that it's streaming. Because I think what's going to happen <clears throat> is people who are teachers will see this once. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> What happens here? I'm doing okay. All right, do you want to go get some water? Yeah. Go get some water. Go. Uh, we can we can fill in. Uh, um, as they say on MSNBC, this is live television. <laughs> <laughs> things, things happen. Um, so the well, maybe I could contribute something while we're waiting for Russia sure, to go, come back. Go ahead. Uh, this up is up Michael until three Doyle. years ago. 
uh, I taught at Ball State University in the history department. I taught a, a regular course on uh, the US Vietnam War. I also taught uh, two courses on uh, the uh, culture of the 1960s from one of global standpoint and one from a US standpoint. I would always bring in at least uh, 15 minutes of cued video for each <laughs> class period that varied between 50 and 75 minutes. I would assign reading assignments, including primary source documents, and then bring these clips in and then break up the hour uh, showing them and then draw the students out on that. It seems like the students who are in classrooms today are much more visually oriented. They don't read as much as people, you know, former generations of college students mm -hmm. did. So it really helps to integrate the readings with the film uh, and to uh, switch it up over the course of a, of a typical lecture discussion course uh, class. Mm -hmm. Right. Are you, you okay, Rusty? I think I'm back. I think it's one talk too many. <laughs> right. Four days in Texas. I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, there's just a lot of possibilities for how this can be used educationally. And I think it can be used, obviously, at the college level <clears throat> and also at the high school level. And I think it can also be used in a variety of ways so that, you know, one sort of vision of this is that there's a showing of the film and, you know, with a plan, <clears throat> with some orientation before the film is shown uh, and, and a one day follow up afterwards. So that's like the most modest thing that could be done. But I think it would be helpful if we <clears throat> would, uh, I really am having a voice. <clears throat> I think it would be helpful if we also try to assist people who want to do more than one day at, you know, and who want to extend the experience. And it partly depends what people are teaching. I mean, that's a huge factor here. So like, for example, I'm teaching a course on Vietnam right now, right? So this will fit perfectly in my class. And that and anybody that's teaching about Vietnam right now, is going to fit perfectly. You know, it's going to enrich and deepen whatever people are already doing. But there then are probably lots of people who are teaching things which are not exactly the war in Vietnam, but are some kind of world history, American history, recent US history. You know, there's a lot of other frames where people could um, use the film in more than a one day event, right? And so if the trick, I think, and Paul Ladder, I think, has probably given this as much thought as anybody else you know, is to try to get material in the hands of teachers who may want to use the film in a, in a, in a modest way or um, other teachers who are really going to make it a much broader kind of lesson. And to the extent that we can, you know, give people some help with that um, for both of those kinds of things, I think, you know, that will also spur people to do it if, they, if there are resources that, that are made available. The other thing I think is very important in this is actually two things and then uh, I'll stop. I mean, one thing that I think is very important, which goes to what Robert said, which is that this history is God, right? I mean, I teach these courses and, you know, not, almost none of this has been heard of by anybody. And if you say protest, a lot of what my students think is that that was people being mean to returning vets. So for a lot of educators at whatever level they're on, they're really on ground zero for the most part about what kids know or don't know. And that is challenging in terms of us being able to give hints to people or ideas to people about how to deal, you know, with that situation there that students are starting from literally nowhere. Um, and I think the film is going to be great for that because people will be able to see you know, a, you know, this very wide experience and they're going to be very surprised by it. Um, I mean, most of my students don't have any idea about vets or, or descent in the military either. Um, but again, I don't think it's just my students. I mean, other people can weigh in, but I think really this history has been, you know, largely as, as Robert said, disappeared. So the question is, can we get materials in the hands of people to make who are teachers who can then feel that they can take this on without having to rediscover the wheel, right? If they have to do too much research for, you know, whether again, at college or high school or whatever, if they're going to have to do a lot of work to prepare for this, then they're not going to do it. So I think that's a 
premium. Now we've hired this one intern. That's not a perfect solution, but he's working on materials. I think, you know, anybody that can work, Paul sent out a letter about this. I think, you know, getting ideas from people about materials, you know, we could then go through it and put it into something that's very coherent. Well, I think lots of you, know, anybody that can come forward with ideas of materials should do it. Um, so I think that's one that's one thing. I also think that for teaching purposes, we need to give them some kind of, um, you know, conflict of material, you know, that, it, that teachers are going to want to have some range of perspectives. So that would, to the extent we can do that, I think it'll be very helpful. Finally, I think the biggest question, which I, I, I would guess other people in this Zoom, you know, are, are also probably thinking about is, for, to a large extent, the level of protest in this country right now is not very great, um, you know, given all the things that are going wrong. You know, young people are not growing up with a sense that they can, you know, participate politically and actually affect anything, which is what this move, you know, movie is trying to show. So I think in terms of educational work, that what's really also an important ingredient is for teachers to find ways to not only go over the past, but to begin engaging students around the question of protest. You know, have you ever protested before? What kind of protests are taking place? Is it worth anybody's time? You know, that, that some, you know, again, maybe that will be more than, you know, just some questions and ideas that we put out to people. But I think in terms of connecting to kids, that the film needs to have some connection to the present. So, I mean, I, that's not very well worked out. I think anybody on this Zoom or who sees this Zoom, I think, um, you know, Paul put out a call for material. Um, I'm happy to help. Uh, we have this student who's doing work, but that's not, you know, everybody's input will be very welcome for that. Again, keeping in mind that what we're trying to do is have stuff to get to teachers so that they can use this film efficiently and without feeling burdened by how much work, extra work they have to do. It would be very helpful, Rusty, if you sent your your current syllabus around. Right. But you could send it to John and he could send it to the DPCC list. Right. Well, the question is what needs to get out to tens of thousands of teachers? How to get uh, And that's, that's the one sheet, one page, sheet with the three or four questions, the paragraph or two that explains how you can use the film and why it's important to use the film, and then the four or five questions or whatever that that you can give your students the day before it run, it premieres, or that you can use as the basis of a classroom discussion. We need that resource yesterday, but by the day after tomorrow at the latest. Um, let me ask one thing about students and their interest in, in our ancient times when there wasn't streaming. Um, the night that something showed on television, that's when you got the buzz. The next day in the classroom or the next day at the proverbial water cooler. I mean, does that, that night of exist anymore or the younger generation so accustomed to time shifting that there's no big deal to prepare for the actual screening, that it's a sort of older generation that will watch American experiences because they always watch American experiences. Um, I don't know, Paul, just, Rusty. I, yeah, I just put my two cents in, which is not, it really just speculative. Um, I think Sunday night in terms of students and teachers is, is, is a is a bit of a problem, um, you know, and that's why I think it's very important that there are these many ways for people to watch it. Because what what is Sunday night? This is when all the students realize they haven't done their work for college, and they're cramming till two in the morning because they haven't done their work, <laughs> or, or their parent, you know, or, or teachers who are cramming on Sunday night. Um, but I, that's why I say, I mean, obviously, no, it's, it's showing. No, Rusty, it's showing on a Tuesday night. Oh, it's I'm Tuesday sorry. night. Okay, it's the twenty eighth. Our our program was a Sunday night, but the film okay. is showing on a weekday night on Tuesday night. Well, I rescind all that non wisdom. Um, <laughs> I do think that um, 
the um, you know the fact that this is going to be available in an ongoing way, which is something that didn't used to be true. So if you didn't catch it that night, you know, then forget about. It. So I think that's going to be an asset, and I think you know to the extent that we can get usable material into the hands of teachers. Okay. Um, you know, we'll increase the chances that people will make use of it, you know, feel encouraged that, okay, I don't really know that much about it, but, you know, these are some resources I can learn a little bit, get up to speed um, without a lot of trouble and, and, and move forward with it. Okay, could you put on the chat the name of your book so people can sure. find it on their local bookstore or Amazon or wherever? I mean, it is John, but I don't want to use it to be plugging my book, but yeah, I would say essentially, it was really annoying, but it is true that a major part of what my book is about is about what impact did the peace movement have on policy? Not just that it was there, which I think, you know, I know 10, 10 years ago, you and Robert met and planned all this out to come no, just at the time it. of the anniversary of the peace agreement. I'm right. Just <laughs> that's the deep state of the anti-war movement. So our last speaker, and then more open discussion, Michael Doyle, I met when I went to uh, the uh, wonderful program that he and Mary put together at Ball State for the 50th anniversary of the moratorium um, and discovered that there's a whole world out there that I didn't really know much about uh, and then discovered there's, here we have the Suffolk County museum in uh, Riverhead where I live and there are museums all over the country and institutions in every city of many different kinds and people that are characterized as local historians and the question is how to find them and how they might want to get involved if they're not already involved in this era and in relationship to the PBS film. Michael. Okay well um I have more to talk about than uh, time would be allocated to me. So I think what I'm going to try to do with my spiel is to drop some topics. And then if uh, other participants in the Zoom want to uh, post questions, we can you know get down to the nitty gritty on some of these. But uh, let me explain. Uh, when you invited me to participate as a panelist tonight, John, uh, you uh, had said that one of the things that uh, the VPCC was looking at was the connection between local history and, and national history. And you knew that what I was doing at Ball State was kind of a, a, a part of that effort. I'm a public historian. That's a term that has uh, two national organizations that represent professionals who mostly do history in a public setting for non-academic audiences. And the, the problem is that public history is actually taught in uh, graduate programs. In my case, I headed up a 35-year-old uh, undergraduate program at Ball State where people majored in this and did full semester, full-time internships in settings where they were doing history in Ford with the public. So one of the things that distinguishes the type of history that um, public historians do versus, uh, let's say, what Rusty is doing as an academic historian is we mostly work as a collaborative uh, we don't do things solo, whereas academic historians tend to work on projects by themselves and publish monographs and articles and the like. Uh, we, we collaborate with the public, meaning that we have to cede some of the authority with our background and knowledge in the topic to people who may be history buffs, uh, non-professionals, people who are enthusiastic about history. That's what brings them to the topic. And then um, we are involved in the collection, the interpretation, and the preservation of history. Now, when you go from public history, which is a very broad topic, to local and community history, local and community history, you might say, is a subset of the public. And then uh, John was just talking about all of these museums. There are literally over a thousand history museums in North America uh, that um, in recent decades have become acquainted with the fact that they know more about the 19th and early 20th centuries of their communities than they do with the post-World War II period when there's been so many dramatic changes. So from having moved uh, from uh, Muncie, Indiana, where I taught at Ball State for a couple of decades, uh, back to Winona, Minnesota, where I grew up, uh, this is a town of 26,000 people that has three higher education institutions in it. 
that means that I've got academic resources available to me, similar to what I had at Ball State, but I don't have any uh, special claims on faculty, staff, and students that can collaborate with me in doing uh, public history, local history uh, activities. So part of what the emphasis that I want to make is that at Ball State, I had built relationships with the public television station and the public radio station, both of which were based on campus and used faculty and staff and students uh, as their workforce. They were very open to collaborative uh, projects with faculty involving students. And so through them, uh, I was able to do a number of oral history projects with both Vietnam veterans and anti-war activists. And these were used in various ways. So when Ken Burns did his long documentary series on the Vietnam War, we collaborated with a public television station to do a public screening and then a panel discussion that included veterans that we had done oral history interviews with and some of the, the protest community. And there was an overlap between veterans that came back and like John Kerry and the people depicted in uh, Sir No Sir uh, who went from uh, being uh, somebody involved in the combat mission to somebody who went into a full-time protest mode against the war and were speaking with the authority of their having uh, served in that war. So in, a, in addition to the panels, we, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam Moratorium uh, Committee in uh, mid-October 2019, Mary Posner, as an alumna of Ball State, who had been the head of the local VMC chapter at Ball State, approached me as somebody who specialized in this field to do a reunion, and I encouraged her to expand that to a conference and a reunion of the former alumni activists uh, so that we could be one of the nodes of commemoration that fit into what the VPCC was promoting. A lot of local areas that would talk about how their local history fit into the national movement here. We got a tremendous amount of cooperation from not only the public radio and television station, but most especially to our university library and the archives and special collections uh, helped to coordinate a number of things. One, they recorded all of the panels and David Harris, our keynote speaker for the commemorative conference uh, was both web live streamed and then recorded and it's now part of the digital media repository. So anybody can participate, you might say, or at least view the, the work that was done at the conference, including the panels uh, from that. They also documented this with a, a photographer that we recruited who did a lot of still photography during this. Uh, a student of mine, a graduate student, recorded a 90 minute oral history interview with Mary that's now being web streamed from the digital media repository. It's been fully transcribed and is keyword searchable, which then helps it land in uh, searches that people are doing through Google that want to learn about the anti-war movement, especially the campus-based uh, part of that. Um, we also were able to uh, convince Mary to donate her scrapbook on the Ball State VMC's uh, activities, which included everything that had been published in both the student newspapers and the, the uh, daily newspaper, and then regional publications like the Indianapolis Star and national publications, including the Washington Post. All of these were digitized by our archives and special collections, and they now also are available 24-7 with uh, anybody who has internet access. That was then annotated by a, a special project with the Department of English, that had people that were uh, part of a digital storytelling uh, major uh, that uh, helped bring some additional information so people could decode what they were looking at through the scrapbook. One other thing to mention now that I've talked about all of the resources we were able to leverage through long-term relationships at our university is to talk about me as a solo public historian practitioner without an academic uh, portfolio here in Winona. And I wanted to just mention, following up from suggestions that my other panelists have just made, in our town, 26,000 people, we have no less than five different uh, uh, organizations that are constantly looking for speakers on a whole range of topics. And it's not hard to suggest tie-ins like for a documentary uh, and then uh, panelists that can go along with that. 
I have not done that for this. I was just asked by John to be involved and make suggestions uh, two weeks out. But what I'm going to say is that if a town of 26,000 has this many venues that are going begging for uh, uh, people to do uh, programs, I'm not sure you could do a 90 minute screening followed by a panel as part of these. They typically program within a one hour framework with Q and A, but I think that the possibilities are out there. And then secondly, I've been doing oral histories that are uh, done with digital video that are now also being uh, uh, archived and web streamed from Winona State University. They've done it as a labor of love and I've contributed all, all of my time, 40 hours uh, so far, uh, at the end of uh, uh, 2022. And with this material, I'm working with a younger activist uh, here in town who's very interested in developing an archive around the radical activity of this Mississippi River town. Uh, she's just done a project documenting people that have been living on boathouses on the Mississippi River that have been part of the activist artist community uh, in this community that, that goes back to the 1960s era. So we've been uh, digitizing uh, uh, news articles, uh, ephemera, including uh, protest posters, things on that order. And uh, recently I acquired a 30 minute documentary made by Granada Television uh, that was affiliated with the BBC that was done with a local draft resistor here in Winona in 1967. He refused induction. He was part of the Catholic left in this town and he did two years of prison like uh, David Harris did uh, uh, in Sandstone here in, in the Minnesota Federal Prison. Uh, but his story was told very eloquently before he was actually sent off to prison. They uh, interviewed him and his family and community members during that period of time uh, up to the point where he went up and was sentenced and, and spurted off to jail. I found this because I followed the trail of other people that uh, could put me in touch uh, with this activist. He's still, he's today an, uh, an archivist at SUNY Brockport, and he provided me with a copy of this film that I'm going to contribute to the Winona County Historical Society that because of efforts that I'm making in conjunction with this other younger colleague, uh, they're very interested in building more local history collections on the 1960s and 70s, which as I say, they have a dearth of information about and a great deal of interest in collecting while the eyewitnesses to the participants in this history are still around to uh, contribute, not only their stories through oral history, but also their uh, personal collections, the documents, the ephemera uh, and the like that uh, I've just been outlining. All of those take time and research, which is the same as any historian needs to do, but making uh, uh, connections with local museums. And if you have them, are lucky enough to have colleges and universities in your community, I find that their special collections and archives departments are avidly interested in partnering with people who can bring this material to them and then they can help with doing public programming around. So I did a number of talks in archives and special collections around the oral history projects that we did. And then we've done pop-up exhibits also in their reading room with the ephemera collections that uh, people like Mary with her scrapbook uh, were able to donate. So that's probably enough for right now to just give you, dangle in front of you some possibilities. I could be happy to give you any more information in terms of how to go about this uh, if others are, are interested in pursuing that line of inquiry. Well, you've suggested, if, say, somebody in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or in Riverhead, New York, one place is a county historical society. Another place is a university's archives or history of, that there's somebody within every university who's responsible for compiling history. And, uh, oh, and as Steve mentioned a moment ago, you know, there's 300 odd uh, public uh, television stations, but they really vary in size and capability. And so, uh, as I say, there's really not much time between now and, and the premier broadcast to reach out and build the relationships with, although Mary's had some success in just, you know, contacting people that, um, you know, with her local station, but I'm thinking about the long game a little bit more. And that's what I wanted to, to get people thinking right now. So many people that were involved in the civil rights, anti-war, women's movement, LGBTQ, et cetera, they're up in years, they're downsizing, they're getting rid of things. They pass away and their kids have 48 hours to clear out an apartment 
this stuff is not making its way into the archives. Uh -huh. And for those of us that have collections and who know people that have collections, we have an obligation, I feel, to help them, uh, the people that possess this material, this knowledge, to transmit it while they still have the ability to uh, reach out to the collections and then to provide the metadata about what exactly it is that you're giving people. Uh, that typically leads to an extended interview by special collections and archivists or historical society directors because they want to get as much background knowledge on the provenance of the material that's donated to them. This is something that I would recommend that we be about right now because in 10 years, as we just lost David Harris, uh, it's going to disappear. And we don't know what will happen to the residue of the memories, the, the documents, the photographs, all of the other material that we build up uh, as we go through life, but maybe even our kids aren't that interested in. But the repositories are very interested in it. And I'm suggesting that we help to uh, nurture that process so that the stuff doesn't get obliterated from the memory that we're trying to conserve through activities like uh, we're talking about tonight. Two things. One is um, I set up an archive at Trinity College where I used to teach. I'm now retired. And that ha that's a pretty rich archive. And it has in it not only everything that I, I'm, uh, I'm a real pack rat that uh, I kept, but also the papers from Resist, uh, which because of, it's a funding organization collected lots of stuff from uh, groups and, and uh, of every kind that you can name uh, all around the country. Uh, there are similar archives, larger ones in Austin at the University of, of Texas that uh, Alice Embry and others on the SDS list that, that um, uh, Vivian and, and I are in, involved with. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, the town mint and, at NYU and the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society, but those local ones are wonderful, and um, they, 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 you're, you're quite right, they're, they're looking uh, often for material, particularly locally based. The other thing I wanted to add is um, not only stations, but newspapers. There are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, agitation about uh, the loss of local newspapers, and that has that's true. It, it, it is it is the case, but most localities have at least weeklies, and the weeklies are often wanting material. All you have to do is look at them; you'll know that. Um, we have one uh, here in the, uh, what is it called? The Bergen Record. Well, no, yeah, I'm, I'm not not only the Bergen Record, which is daily, but the um, Gold Coast Weekly, or whatever exactly it's called, and this is an opportunity to uh, to contact them. I think um, to call uh, attention to the uh, to the film and and the possibility of uh, of interviewing people. Other questions or comments about this public history theme. Um, Michael, is there, somebody asked in the chat how to reach these na two national organizations you mentioned. Um, is well, that is something that PBS would have been doing and American Experiences would do naturally or is that something that we need to take the initiative for? Well, the, the organizations I'm referring to specifically, one's called the National Council in Public History. It's headquartered uh, at uh, Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis. And the other is the American Association for State and Local History, which is headquartered in Nashville. Both of them are organizations of professional, uh, public and local and community historians. Uh, and they have uh, publications that go out constantly to their members uh, with links to programs that would be of interest in furthering uh, the uh, uh, the cause of improving the quality of public history throughout really the uh, US and, and abroad. So if, I would not assume that American Experience would have sent the material, 
Uh, I think this would be a good idea uh, on VPCC's uh, uh, part. Uh, I'm getting the impression that American Experience uh, does some things, but the fact that there may not even be a teacher's guide uh, for the premier is something uh, that tells me that maybe the resources may not be the same as what you can get if you're, um, you know, Ken Burns, let's say. Uh, to, that, to that point, I wanted to make another quick suggestion, and that is um, where you have access to a teacher's college, Ball State University, like Winona State, uh, started as a teacher's college and became a comprehensive university in the 60s era. They have very robust social studies teaching education programs. We always hired uh, a, an intern from that major uh, and got a little stipend for her to prepare these uh, teacher guides that would go out electronically uh, with links to where primary sources and film clips uh, that would comport with the projects that we were doing. Assuming that we had to create the teacher's guides, we, we couldn't rely on them being done at a national level. If they were on a national level, we didn't do our own. Uh, but it's just that um, you can sometimes get really effective teacher's guides for both uh, teaching of social studies at the elementary and the secondary level. Often the ones created for the secondary level are appropriate for the college level as well, and vice versa. There's a lot of uh, advanced placement courses that blur the line between secondary and, and collegiate uh, coursework and, and teacher guides. So uh, just to put that out there, um, you know, when you do, can't find it, you can make your own. It's not that hard. You can find ways to partner to get it done so that it meets the social studies education standards for your state. That's a very important thing because if it ticks off those standards, then the teachers can justify the classroom time in using that curriculum. So Steve and Robert, um, can, does your bandwidth permit you to contact these two organizations or how, how should we proceed on that? I think not right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I don't, but maybe Steve. Uh, All right, um, Michael, just, if you can send me addresses, email addresses, I'll get something out in the next. All right, sounds good. Okay. Um, anybody uh, else who hasn't said anything, David, Hawk, um, do you want to add anything? And David is another star of the show. So <laughs> having been no, one no, of the organizers uh, of the that's board. That's fine. Well, I'll, I'll wait. I, I, I have a question uh, for Bob. Is it completely done or are you on a crash course to get everything uh, finally complete? We sent the final, final, final version off on March 1st. And there's a little bit of uh, back and forth on some very, very technical things, but it's, it's essential, it's in their hands and you know, our crash course is, is over, thank God. Oh, well, but terrific. Good that, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the can. That's right. All right. Well, anybody have any final comments or questions? Uh, yeah, Jack. Uh, just getting back to uh, Steve and, and Robert when they were trying to uh, get to the heart of uh, what needs to be done uh, right uh, around the broadcast. I was just wondering if you had any model in mind of a national broadcast where there was uh, some grassroots follow-up or where there were some strategies. Was there any model that you had in mind? I think we're, <laughs> we're doing it as we go. I, I don't think we have a model. I mean, I think this is a whole new, a whole new, uh, project. I think the thing that I'm, one of the many things I've got from this conversation is that right now we're really wrapped up in things related to the premier, which largely from, from our standpoint is getting media interviews and, you know, reaching the local stations, that sort of thing. But the fact, I mean, you know, what I'm getting is that there is a long game here, as Michael said, that, that the fact that this is going to be available indefinitely on a national, actually global way, you know, because of the streaming opportunities, 
that that really changes the nature of what we should think about. You know, that, that we've got time and we've got a lot of, I mean, just incredible opportunities so that we don't have to think about what could be done before March 28th or even uh, June 1st. You know, it's really something that we can think about things that could be done, you know, particularly in say like classrooms for next year or the year after or ongoing. But I, I think that's one of the really important lessons that we've got. I think I see Steve's wanted to add yeah. something. Yeah, I've been um, in the distribution of films for many years. And you have to look at this in stages. Right now, what's important is to promote this as widely as possible to get the largest possible viewing audience, you know, to um, inspire people and whatever. Second will be, uh, the film will be available afterwards if people want to do community events or screenings and so forth that are going to be more conveniently scheduled when people have time to organize something around this. Third is uh, PBS distribution will be making this available promoting it to class to colleges and, and schools for educational use. So, you know, providing um, some kind of guides to go along with it may come at, at that point. Um, like the, uh, the Burns Novik series has uh, a classroom guide, right? Which people have probably seen online. Uh, it would be great if we had something like that it could be available in PBS distribution, start promoting this to colleges and schools. And then finally, uh, internationally, you know, when PBS International makes it available around the world, you know, it, there's an opportunity to, you know, to encourage people to use it, watch it, so forth in other countries too. So staging is important for something like this. Steve, when it streams in the first couple of weeks of, or month of open streaming, is that geographically limited or can people anywhere in the world sign in and stream it? That's a good question. I think it may be um, US. Um, could you could you find that out? Because it'd be used very good to be able to tell people mm. in Vietnam yeah. if they could watch it. I will try to have for you a one-page thing in the next couple of days. Great. Um, uh, th this conversation has focused my thinking about that. So I should be able to do it. Okay, super. Well, could you just explain what your what the what your one pager will be? What your one page will be. Um, as as a way of approaching uh, the the thinking about the film, either for a classroom or for uh, a community group or <clears throat> that kind of thing. I see. I have. Jack, one, I have sorry, a go ahead. Of, question for um, also for, for, for um, Robert. Um, also thinking about how to create, you know, materials that could be used um, in classrooms. Is it possible now, uh, I see Mary commented on it, that most of us haven't seen the film. And it's hard to make, have our resources be as good as they could be if we, for example, had a better sense of the content of the film. So I really have two questions. Is, is it possible for more of us to see it? And if not, is it possible for some kind of summary of the film to be, you know, so that you get an idea of what the scenes are? Because the truth of the matter is it would really be helpful to see the trajectory of the film in order, you know, that we actually could create better materials. Uh, the quick, yeah, the quick answer on, on seeing it is no. Okay. That that's that's a uh, you know I mean PBS doesn't want that to have happen and so on. Um, there is a fairly lengthy description of it you know that PBS did. I don't know whether you I don't know whether I sent that to you. I yeah, yeah. I guess yeah, but it's a it's a several I don't know what four or five page long which does have a pretty good description. It is pretty um, good. Yeah, I could, uh, let's see. It's so, also on our blog page for right, right. organizers. The blog page has it. Yeah, that's what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah. An, ed an educational classroom guide sometimes relies upon scenes. You see this right. and then there's some questions in right. regarding that scene. Yeah, so. that's going to that's gonna have to wait until after March yeah. 28th. Jack, uh, yeah. the question that Jack asked, 
actually stimulated something in my mind. And I don't know, I mean, there have been times when something's shown up on national television and has created echoes, grassroots echoes, community groups, discussions, further discussions, actions. I mean, this, I don't know whether this would do that um, or whether it's too backward looking to, to lead to people say, hey, let's, let's in two weeks invite everybody from Des Moines who wants to talk about their experience during that period of time to come together to have a potluck or to just come and spend a Saturday afternoon together to connect personally and and with the history um, I, I mean that's the only Jack that's that's the only idea that that's that's come up in my mind about that question Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I did have a, a parting comment, if you uh, will. Uh, it, earlier in the uh, discussion, uh, somebody posed a question about uh, possible blowback because of the you know, left-wing protest nature of the film. And what I wanted to say was, uh, in all the years that I taught the US survey uh, course, I always introduced this prospect that the United States was created in a dissent against the world's largest democratic quote unquote regime uh, to that point in history. Uh, and so we were born in a revolution against, you know, the settled opinion of how people should be governed. And our problem as a, as a nation from that time to the present is how do you govern a nation of dissenters? So today the energy all seems to be on the right wing. People went to Washington to protest what they considered a corrupt government and essentially to try to steer it in a different direction. The left had that energy back in the Vietnam War era and afterwards. And so I would tend to frame community screenings and discussion around coming together over this notion of how one protests and dissents in order to set the nation on a trajectory that seems more closely aligned with its expressed ideals. That takes it out of the specific politics of the left and the right and puts it into a conversation between people who are really upset about the state of the nation today. And maybe that can help connect our current fraught political uh, uh, conversations with the period that's depicted in the film so that we're not just looking at something that happened 50 years ago, we're actually looking at something that's still ongoing now and has been really since the inception of the country. Yeah, and go ahead, Robert. I, I just want, no, I, I appreciate that. I wanted to just sort of go back to the blowback question a little bit. Um, that the film, uh, well, Steve Talbot and myself are journalists or have been, you know, I'm. I'm retired at this point, though I don't know whether I'm retired or not. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, I was a, a business journalist basically for uh, 40 years, you know, and I wrote for Fortune. Steve was a, basically a broad, you know, TV journalist. And I think when you see the film, you'll see that it's not, it doesn't have the feel of a movement film. It's very much a... Um, you know, it's a reported, you know, it's trying, we're trying to describe what happened. And there's not quite as much in the film from inside the White House as out on the streets, but it definitely, it goes back and forth. I mean, the original idea was to sort of go back and forth between what's going on inside and what's going outside. And so that it, it really is that way. And I think that that's part of the reason that PBS is willing to take a risk with it, yeah. that, that it is a film that I think people won't feel when they watch it, they won't necessarily feel that this is something that's really, um, you know, it, it, well, they don't want to feel like it's a, a movement film. Right. And I think that's a, that, that I think will make it easier uh, for uh, people to, 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 uh, 
use it in non-movement settings, you know, such as classrooms. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's just a... I, I hope you're correct, but from at least a third of it that we saw, <laughs> I think you're going to get people simply that objective description of what happened mm. is highly partisan. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so much but we'll no, see. I, but I know. But it, that, yeah. that, that's, that does open up the, I mean, we've long aspired to how do we reach out to other contemporary social movements and interact with them. And it may be that the film helps to provide a vehicle locally for doing that where you're not just inviting people from the Vietnam era, but more contemporary activists and organizers to reflect on what they're seeing and what that has to do with the environmental issues or the other kinds of things that they're now involved with. We've gone uh, way beyond. Um, and, and I think, uh, I'm happy to stay talking with you if you have some particular questions, but I, uh, we started out an hour and 20 minutes ago. So, and this will all be available to watch uh, by tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Um, so uh, any rate, uh, thank you. This was I'd say not a, we didn't have an immense crowd here, but we did create a, a document that I help I hope will now be useful uh, to others to inspire them to make use of what you guys have produced and you know and I think it's hard to underestimate how important your work has been and the seg or the inter integration of Rusty's work um, and uh, you know Rusty's work provides the vehicle for people who get inspired by the film to get into the real depths of the history. And uh, so hopefully will not only be a great success in itself, but we'll put her on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> <laughs>